Hello and welcome to Two Sigma Presents Pandas at a Crossroad, the past, present, and future. My name is Rachel Malvin and I work on the engineering education team at Two Sigma. We have a culture of learning and, at Two Sigma and my team builds education programs that increase productivity, build connections among our technical teams and support intellectual development. At Two Sigma, we also have close ties to open source software and academia. I have the great pleasure to help bring in professors and grad students to lecture on their latest research and work with employees to develop conference talks. And one of my favorite responsibilities is running the Hacker Lab, Two Sigma's internal hackerspace. To learn more about our culture of learning, check out the articles on our blog, Insights. And if you're a student, be sure to check out our PhD fellowships. I'd like to invite you all to head to slido.com and enter the event code TS Presents, which we will be using for Q&A at the end of the session. Please submit your questions there at any time during the lecture. I'm proud to introduce Jeff Rebeck, a managing director at Two Sigma, overseeing the research environment and also lead core dev at Pandas. As a former quant, Jeff Rebeck has much experience in building financial trading systems using Python and working with very large data. He has been a core committer to the Pandas project since 2011 and has managed the project since 2013. Jeff also holds a BS in computer science from MIT. After the talk, stick around to ask questions of Jeff and other Two Sigma team members. And with no further ado, here is Jeff Rebeck. Thanks, Rachel. Um, I'm Jeff Rebeck, and I'm today going to talk to you about Pandas at a Crossroads. All right, let's go. So the first slide is the important legalese. This is basically saying we don't offer legal uh, investment advice. OK, so I'm a former quant. I worked at Deutsche Bank for a number of years. Um, I've been a uh, core committer to Pandas for about the last 10 years uh, and really managing the project uh, since about 2013. Um, I've been at Two Sigma for the last five years, and I'm a managing director here. Um, I'm working on basically holistic approaches to modeling. Some of this will come out uh, you know, throughout the talk. So Two Sigma is very passionate about open source. We uh, do lots with lots of different projects. We create, for example, um, we have created uh, you know, BeakerX, which we uh, contributed to uh, Jupyter. BeakerX is a, um, uh, it's a plugin right now that does um, multiple, uh, you know, multi-language type uh, notebooks. Uh, for example, we, we've, and we contributed to many different projects. For example, we've contributed to, to Flint and Spark, um, for example, and we fund many projects too. So we funded uh, Jupiter, Arrow, and Pandas, of course. In addition, uh, we've actually contributed, you know, over to overall ecosystems, things like NumFocus, we funded for the last five years, and the Python Software Foundation. Two Sigma is, uh, you know, committed to sustaining digital infrastructure for the public good, and and so therefore we care about these things. We that's why we actually try to contribute as much as possible all over the place. So today, let's talk about Pandas. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about myself and how I uh, became the principal maintainer of what was arguably the most critical and used data science library in the world, Pandas. I'm gonna talk about the responsibilities and challenges that come along with maintaining Pandas. Uh, and I'm gonna give some context um, of some of the data science tools and how they are being pushed to the limits and how Pandas in particular is being pushed to the limits. I'm gonna show you why uh, Pandas is at a crossroads. I'm gonna show you um, some options, three options that I see for moving forward. And finally, I'm gonna leave you with more questions than answers. So let's get started. So, oops, so Pandas. Pandas is a Python package that provides fast, flexible and expressive data structures. It's designed to make working with relational, relation or labeled data both easy and intuitive. So the primary abstraction is the data frame. A, a data frame is a two-dimensional labeled data structure with columns of potentially different types. You could think of it as a, a spreadsheet or a SQL table. Uh, Pandas actually adds an optional index for both the row and column labels to make this uh, easy to use. And so this leads to some uh, very nice features. Uh, Pandas supports explicit data alignment. Uh, and so this is where uh, the operations themselves can align the labels uh, to other uh, operands uh, in the expression. Um, Pandas handles missing data for many data types. Uh, it's mutable in size form, meaning you can add columns and delete columns and so on and so forth. Uh, Pandas provides a lot of flexible group by functionality, the traditional uh, split apply combine operations for both aggregating and transforming data. Uh, 
Um, Pandas provides intelligent label-based indexing. Uh, and of course, this leads to uh, you know, a lot of operands for uh, joining, reshaping, and pivoting uh, data. Uh, next, Pandas provides uh, robust IO, IO tools uh, for reading and writing your data, from, be it from CSV or Excel files, databases, and even a number of binary formats, for example, Parquet, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, and Pandas really grew up on time series specific functionality, such as moving Windows statistics and date shifting. So this is a lot. So here's kind of an overview slide of where Pandas sits from uh, the, the user point of view. Uh, it's often a primary uh, user interacting with data, meaning they're doing data transformation with Pandas, and then they're, they might be dispatching to other libraries. So Pandas is really the go-to you know, pre and post-processor of data. Uh, you know, obviously there's a lot of inbuilt uh, functionality, but this is augmented by the hugely successful Python ecosystem from machine learning libraries to numerical libraries such as SciPy or NumPy uh, to you know, any number of uh, you know, graphical libraries. You can think of Pandas as the Swiss army knife. Uh, it's useful for ad hoc analysis, but it is also greatly used uh, in production. So here's another view. Uh, Pandas sits in, in uh, a layered ecosystem. You know, Python is the base where NumPy and Cython uh, you know, are sort of sitting on top of that. Pandas sits next with the, the, the data frame abstraction alongside other very crucial libraries, Math.lib for uh, graphics, SciPy for you know, a lot of intensive calculations and scikit-learn for machine learning. And so what this allows is you know, uh, li uh, libraries that are uh, you know, even higher in the stack to build upon these known abstractions and use them um, to build up their libraries. So we've seen tremendous growth in Python over the past decade. Um, you know, Python is, it, it's interesting, pa Python was actually a leader in uh, web frameworks for quite a long time, but over the past five or six or seven years has become a, really a leader in data science uh, and machine learning. Um, this graphic actually is about stack overload questions, per, the percentage of, of the take. Uh, it's a useful metric. Here is uh, uh, narrowed down to specifically some Python packages. Uh, I mentioned uh, Django before, you know, common web framework, plus some others. And you can see there's a tremendous growth uh, in, in Pandas uh, percentage uh, increase on this graph. Coincidentally, I started managing the Pandas project around 2013. Um, this slide, you know, read the, the tweet here, but in essence, um, the more, you know, requests and bugs and interactions that Pandas gets from uh, the community, the more, you know, it is being used. And that is, you know, really a testament to how wildly successful Pandas has become. So Pandas started around 2009 um, and we joined NumFocus, which is our, you know, uh, our nonprofit uh, uh, sort of oh, funding organization, not funding organization, more of a uh, managing sort of the ecosystem. Um, but we've actually not had any funding, literally zero funding until 2019. This is uh, you know, a testament how, how successful Pandas has become without this. And only in 2022, this year, very recently, in fact, do we have actual full-time maintainers. We'll touch on that in a little bit. So this is a graphic from uh, 2018 by NumFocus. And this just shows the, the cost of building Pandas. Uh, you know, were it to be built you know, today, it's a, it's a pretty tremendous cost. But the interesting thing is Pandas has really ongoing you know, maintenance and an enhancement cost. And this is where a lot of the uh, sustainability uh, you know, for the entire open source ecosystem really, really drives the, the point home and where funding becomes important. Speaking of funding, these are the current Pandas funders. A lot of different initiatives uh, we now have actually three full-time funded maintainers, uh, you know, one at NVIDIA, one at Intel, and one by a grant at, uh, at NASA. We've transitioned really from an all-volunteer to, you know, some full-time maintainers. This is a fantastic development and really, uh, you know, uh, really promotes sustainability in the open source ecosystem. Um, personally, I am supported by, by uh, Two Sigma uh, and working on Pandas. I'm actually not paid explicitly for Pandas work uh, and I'm all volunteer. So here's some specific things that we've done uh, recently with Pandas. Uh, for example, the, the Chan Zuckerberg initiative, we funded um, the ability to extend the string data types to use PyArrow to make them much faster. Um, with the uh, backing of the University of South Carolina, uh, sorry, Southern California, uh, we've added a non-nanosecond daytime support uh, along for ask for feature. 
this NASA grant that I mentioned before, this is going to promote uh, cross ecosystem uh, parallelism and performance. Uh, really interesting endeavor that you know is a multi year uh, funding. And Bodo AI uh, recently came on board. They're going to help us, uh, you know, work on some of the API uh, improvements that we'll we'll touch on a little bit later in this talk. So uh, another grant that uh, we recently received. So just as important as actual funding uh, projects themselves, very important is to develop the cadre of maintainers. And so this grant um, is again a cross ecosystem grant to uh, help it help folks become become pandas maintainers actually. You know, as they say, you know, we have tons of contributors, but becoming maintainers to review code and to, to actually merge that code uh, is super important. And this grant will help us do that to become you know, a better open source citizen. So this is uh, Wes McKinney, the founder of Pandas. He gets all the kudos. This is me, I get all the complaints. So this is my, my, my classic joke is, you know, Pandas has been around a long time. And I, again, I'll harken back to that Stack Overflow uh, post. The more complaints we have, well, at least it's being used. All right, so how it started for me. Uh, this is, uh, I think I picked one year between 2013 and 2017. The vast majority of my time was spent uh, committing to, to Pandas itself, you know, uh, you know, updating code and improving code and so on and so forth. Uh, how it's going now? I am virtually doing 100% on code review. Uh, you know, things change, you know, as we get more and more contributors, code review becomes more and more important. And so, uh, externally in Pandas, I do almost 100% uh, code review. Luckily, actually inside Two Sigma, I do get to code. Um, and and you know, I do code review as well, but I do get to code. So that's kind of fun. Um, the other interesting point about this, I think in my early years, I think I was, uh, I said yes to everything. And I learned how to say no over the past four or five years. Very interesting uh, stance in, in, in how maintainers work. So let's talk about uh, the Pandas API. So. Pandas is one of the preeminent data science libraries. Uh, so we need to, and we do take a lot of care. So from this graphic, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. And this is very true. Pandas is used by nearly every Fortune 100 company. Um, means it's, it's now an important part of the infrastructure. Um, it has something like 80 million plus monthly downloads. And it probably has multiples of this uh, users itself. So, you know, there is a lot of people using this. We have to take great care. And Pandas is critical to, to Sigma. Um, we use it in something like 90% of our research workflows. Uh, it's an extremely useful tool. We, we care about it. We care that uh, it's maintained, um, or we'll call it that it's responsibly maintained, that the whole open source ecosystem is responsibly maintained and is maintained itself, meaning it's, it's um, uh, what, I'm, what I'm looking for, it is sustainable. So here's another quote by my friend, James Powell, um, basically saying Pandas is a useful tool. It's very expressive. It allows you to do uh, ad hoc analysis. It's performant. Eh, there's a few little problems with the API. It's okay, but it is a useful tool. It gets the job done. So let's talk about the API a little bit. So Pandas is designed around a fluent API, uh, meaning you can chain methods. Um, and I've mentioned this before, but we have a strong commitment to backwards compatibility. This is the key thing. You know, if we start breaking stuff every time every another version comes out, uh, you know, users will 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 just abandon the the product. But at the same time, we need to constantly try to improve the API. And this is over time. We have been iterative. Um, we have really uh, grown up with we'll call it non intentionally based API. When you build a product inside of a company, you can really think about your user base and you can really intentionally design things. Well, Pandas was designed over time by a, almost committee in some sense. Um, it had a great in, uh, initial design and now we're trying to move it forward to almost intentional API design. For example, um, you know, Pandas was originally influenced by SQL and by dplyr, uh, but we're missing some key um, verbs that you know, everybody would like, like select it doesn't exist right now. Uh, or filter, it doesn't do exactly what you'd think it do, does. And so I think over time we can improve these things. Um, for example, the API has uh, some things that allow, that don't allow other uh, implementers of the Pandas API to actually do things in a, a performant way. For example, uh, we, we define sort equals true in group by. And, and you know, if we could do this in a slightly different way, maybe uh, other implementers could be, make it more performant. 
Um, so I think over time, we're, we're gonna get there. So speaking of the ecosystem, there are a number of libraries, I'm gonna to touch on a few here that have a pandas-like API or a, um, some of them have a pandas-like API and some of them just are simply um, distributed data frame libraries or other types of data frame libraries. I'm gonna to touch on them very briefly. For example, Dask uh, is a task editor built in Python. It implements the uh, data frame interface, has a very similar API to pandas. Uh, Dask data frame uses pandas internally as well. Um, and is designed to be distributed and lazy. Uh, Vex is an out of core alternative to Pandas. Uh, it uses HDF5 to create memory maps that avoid loading data sets in memory. Um, uh, Modin is another a distributed data frame library originally built on Ray, uh, in a, but in a more modular way. It actually allows us to use Dask as a scheduler. It can actually, uh, it has the Pandas like API and it also exposes a SQLite uh, API as well. Rapids is very interesting. Uh, they publish a number of GPU-based data frame libraries and other GPU-based you know, machine learning libraries and so on. Uh, it's built on top of Apache Arrow uh, and it has a similar API to Pandas. Spark uh, is a um, uh, part of the big data ecosystem. Uh, in this case, uh, you know, PySpark is a data frame library that uses Spark as the back end. Uh, and it originally, you know, it has a PySpark API. There's also in Spark 3.0, there's a spark.pandas, uh, you know, pretty much mirror copy of the Pandas API. And finally, uh, Polars is a, a data frame library built on Rust using Apache Arrow on, for data storage. Uh, one thing to note about all these libraries, these all use lazy evaluation. So they all have a different look and feel than Pandas because of this lazy evaluation. Uh, and they're also, uh, uh, they, to a large extent, they mimic the Pandas API, not entirely and not uh, explicitly, but a lot of them do that. So Pandas has just, a different feel. It uses eager evaluation under the hood. Here's another library called IBIS. So it's a high level uh, Python API for data analysis. Um, this is a, a, has a fluent pandas like syntax, uh, can express virtually any SQL query, uh, and it supports module backends for querying. Uh, in other words, you can basically compile the uh, the expression tree to really different flavors of, of SQL or interact with different types of systems, whether they be DBMS or others. And we'll show you that in one second. Um, this was originally influenced the API design by dplyr and SQL. Also, maybe not coincidentally, uh, Wes McKinney was one of the original authors of this library as well. And so Ibis actually talks to many of these backends, pandas, uh, but also, you know, DAC ask and spark and, and BigQuery and so on. Uh, it really is crossing the divide between uh, the big data and the data science world. These are, you know, these worlds are really converging uh, and IBIS allows you to talk to them all. So I've talked about all these APIs. There is an effort under, uh, underway right now to unify uh, the APIs across the Python data ecosystem. And this is called Data APIs. It's a QuantLab, QuantSight uh, led partnership across the, um, to unify these. Uh, they've already done this with NumPy. There's been a full published spec where you can basically take, uh, for example, um, a TensorFlow based, uh, you know, uh, a piece of data and translate it, give it to NumPy and it knows how to materialize it. It has a specification of how to do this. Uh, the same thing is going on right now in the data frame world. So we can, you know, take a Modin based, uh, you know, data frame and turn it into pandas. A lot of this code has already been merged into pandas. Um, this is a very interesting development because it now supports multiple APIs, or sorry, multiple libraries, multiple different implementations um, with the same API that is Pandas. So to the extent Pandas can evolve and make uh, an, an even better API, this will support um, even better across the ecosystem. All right, let's talk about some of the challenges in Pandas. I don't expect you to read this, but this is, uh, was a blog post by Wes in 2017. He said the 10, or it's actually 11 items, uh, things he hates about pandas. And so, you know, this is a very valid criticism from one of the original authors. There was a lot of warts in pandas. Pandas grew up in a different time. Uh, you know, back in 2009, when it was first started, uh, the world was a very different place. You generally got a NumPy array and you, and you did stuff with that. Distributed was not necessarily a thing back then. Um, and Pandas solved a lot of the problems back then, but it's been you know, more than 10 years. So uh, in 2018, I did a talk called The Future of Pandas. So as of uh, 2018, um, you know, 
we had solved a number of uh, things. And since then, since 2018 till now, we've done uh, even a few more things. Um, oops, wait, let me go back here. So uh, for example, we've uh, created an, an API for extension arrays. This allows folks to, you know, inside pandas and outside pandas to, uh, you know, essentially build their own data types and really have pandas recognize them as first class. Uh, for example, this allows support for categorical and missing value support across all the data types. A common criticism of pandas is that we have this thing called the block manager. Um, interestingly enough, the extension uh, API actually uh, causes um, us to think our, to change how we think about data, meaning all of these extension arrays are one dimensional. So now the, uh, when pandas holds these extension arrays, we can actually think of a data frame as a, a collection of one dimensional things. You don't even have to care about the block manager or understand the internals. So this is actually moving pandas closer to the internals or closer to the metal. So we've also enabled pandas to talk to other libraries that, you know, I mentioned this in, my, in one of the very first slides. So one of those libraries is Arrow, for example. So today we defer to Arrow uh, is an optional component to defer, for example, for multi-threaded uh, CSV reading. We have the string backed uh, data type that I mentioned earlier. We can, we can read and write to Parquet and the ORC format, which are traditional big data type formats. Um, you know, this interoperability is super awesome. We've done it also with Numba. Um, we built a lot of support into Pandas for uh, uh, the ability to dispatch user defined functions to Numba to make them more performant. So we support this, for example, in some of the rolling operations. But so this has been solid growth. This has been solid, but it's been incremental growth. So let's talk about the elephant in the room. And these are the things that, you know, even though we've addressed some of the uh, sort of criticisms of pandas, we still have some that we just haven't even really touched. For example, uh, the internals are too far from the metal. Uh, we have a lack of transparency into memory use and RAM management. Uh, and we don't really do multi-core to be honest. Um, you know, there are ways to do some things in a multi-core way, but it's not fundamentally designed. And it's probably very hard to change to, to make it support true multi-core. So this is another way of looking at the data tooling spectrum. Um, as the size of the data has increased, you know, as I say, Pandas started in 2009. Big data back then was maybe a few gigabytes. So Pandas was actually super awesome back then. But now that is small data. And, you know, medium data is, you know, five to 100 gigabytes. And anything bigger than that, we'll call it big data. So as I say, the, pen, the uh, data science stack and the big data stack uh, uh, tool set are really converging. And Pandas is super awesome. When you get to 10 gigabytes, it becomes less than awesome. Okay, so the question is, what, if anything, can we do about this? Are there any easy solutions? Why can't we just get a giant machine from, from AWS? We can get a two terabyte machine, they're cheap. Or maybe I should use a distributed data frame. But these always have trade-offs. And that's really what we're, we're gonna talk about. You know, some of these things can be easy to use or, uh, you know, do I have to switch the API or maybe some things cost more, you know, using a distributed data frame always may not cost a whole lot in terms of actual dollars and cents, but it costs in terms of complexity and the mental model now um, just becomes a little bit harder. And so, you know, these are some of the trade-offs that you have to deal with, but I counter this with, well, do you need to scale? Or rather, how much do you need to scale? Can, you know, is working with 10 gigabytes enough? And for a lot of workloads, it is. And actually, you'll, you'll probably realize by the end of this talk that I think for many of the workloads, this is enough. So Pandas is just good enough for a lot of things. So we're at a crossroads here. What do we do? And so I'm gonna talk about three different uh, ways that we could go. We'll call it this way, that way, and the other way. So first, this way. What if we undertook a rewrite of pandas with a modern backend, meaning kind of scrap the internals and you know, see what happens. So this would be great. We could keep you know, growing with the ecosystem, fantastic. But this might raise some backward compatibility concerns. We very likely will have to break some things. Are we then just competing with the other, uh, you know, data frame libraries that I mentioned? Is that a good thing? 
Uh, and this would require some collaboration. You know, even though I mentioned we have three full-time maintainers now, uh, you know, paid maintainers, this would require a, a substantial effort to, to do this. Um, I don't know if we could do it on our own, meaning all, you know, all in open source, all volunteer. Um, so we might have to have some collaboration. Or what about that way? Let's don't change. Let's just keep improving, uh, incrementally improving uh, what we're doing today. Well, we maintain backward compatibility. And this is mature. It's been around a long time. This is great. People love mature software. It just does what they, you know, what they want. It covers the existing use cases. Um, no need to add too many new features. But we may lose some users. People who do need to scale once they hit that 10 gigabyte mark, uh, essentially are going to abandon pandas. On the other hand, the, our existing fund, funding does cover this case, um, so we ought to think about that. So. Oh, but over the years, we've actually added quite a lot of a lot of features. You know, you don't need to read all this, but these are some of the things we've added. I think in the past two years or two and a half years, um, a lot of things, a lot of really value-added functionality that improves the core. Here's a list of um, these are extension arrays that I mentioned, but the, crucially, these are extension arrays that are external to pandas. We didn't develop any of these. These are, for example, supporting units or supporting. Uh, you know, uh, IP address as a first class data type or paths as a first class data type. Very interesting things allow people to really um, extend pandas into domain specific areas. Another thing that actually is coming, this has been developed already, is copy on write. This will allow uh, one to rationalize about, uh, you know, memory usage and, you know, when copies are actually made. There's a, there's a, a nice talk by uh, uh, Joris van der Bosch, who's one of the pandas core devs. All right, let's talk about the other way. So we can embrace the expressiveness. Uh, we could use, uh, you, know, you know, pandas UDFs uh, or as UDFs or as user-defined functions, uh, but except maybe that we need a new engine for distributed analysis. So we get the, the pros of that way. We get all of the stability of pandas, the matureness of pandas. Um, but as I mentioned, we now have a tool-tool mental method. Interestingly enough, Python is kind of like this. Python has you know, a rich API uh, and easy to modify. And then of course, when it needs to go to the metal, it goes to another language, it goes to C. And NumPy does the same thing. They have Python as a high level and then they go to C when they need the, uh, you know, real power. Uh, and Pandas does the same thing. So, but the, the key is that the API to the user is the same. So what I'm suggesting here is that now we have a two tool mental method. If you are lower than 10 gigabytes, you can use the Pandas API. When you're above 10 gigabytes, you might have to change your API, shift from eager to lazy. And so this is cost. This API switching can be a cost. So let me dive into a little bit of, of what we do internally at Two Sigma. So this is called our Bamboo Tech Stack. Um, and so I'm gonna put my, put my Two Sigma hat on right now instead of my Pandas maintainer hat. Um, and so what I'm gonna show you here is we use the library IBIS. Uh, as a key component of our stack. We, we met IBIS before. We call this the Bamboo Tech Stack. So we have, we'll call it a domain specific functionality on top of IBIS. And we use Pandas at its core. So we use Pandas as a user defined function. We can use it uh, uh, because Pandas is very easy to debug. It's very easy to test and it works for many, we'll call it smaller data sets. As I said, we can use it up to 10 gigabytes, no problem. It really allows for a very iterative uh, development environment and it just works. It is, it is pretty great for this. What happens when we need to get bigger? Well, I mentioned before that IBIS takes our same exact code that we wrote and translates to Spark or Dask. We use both of these as a distributed backend. This is super nice. Write the code once, test it out, get it to work, and then scale it up flawlessly or seamlessly. And this is, this is super fantastic. So, you know, as a Spark is built on Apache Spark um, and, you know, we, we, we allow the interaction here at a very high level. This allows us to scale. We also have, uh, you know, this is a pr proprietary co component inside Two Sigma uh, of how we take the same exact code and then run it in our live trading system. So this is the key. This is an example of code that we might write. This is uh, full IBIS code here. 
uh, where we write some expressions, we're gonna be joining some data together, we'll be some filtering, whatever. But the key thing is this, this little function called calculate weight, that is, uh, it's a UDF, it's a user defined function. I pass in some data, it's materialized as pandas uh, data frames. And I can use the full expressive power of pandas inside this engine that's going to run it. So this is the key point here is I can, I, I do have to rewrite my API. I do have to rewrite my mental model. It's similar to pandas, but once I use it, I get a lot of benefit because now I can really, you know, test on my code very easily. I can use a familiar environment for uh, maybe a little manipulation, which the framework doesn't support. And I get to scale it basically for free. So this, the UDF, the user defined function is a key point here. And so we can do one other thing here. So I, I mentioned we, you know, we have these, these three backends here. Um, we can actually add more at relatively little cost. Um, so, and we're doing this here, this other component, we'll call it. So this is a combination of substrate and the arrow C++ compute API. So this is, um, a substrate is, a, is, a, is a actually another library another open source library that uh, interacts with IBIS and arrow C++ we've seen before. So this is the arrow uh, stack. These actually allow us to use a streaming backend and becomes very interesting uh, way to scale on a single machine at this point. And this is, a, uh, this is in development now. This is a, a collaboration between um, Two Sigma and Voltron Data, which is the, one of the sponsors of uh, Apache Arrow. So which one shall we choose? Putting my Two Sigma hat on, it's, I think it's clear we've already chosen option three uh, the other way. So this uh, really allows us to have the power of expressiveness, flexibility, and then we can scale through distributed or streaming execution as needed. It really just satisfies all the, all the check boxes. We don't have to switch tooling. We get to use one tool, you know, we get to write the code once and then run it in many different areas. Let me put my Pandas core dev hat on. This is my see, Pandas hat, get it? Um, so this is interesting. So, you know, some people might advocate for option one this way, um, where we do a complete rewrite of Pandas. I think it's possible. And in fact, there was a, a, an effort to do this. This was the, the so-called Pandas 2.0 effort. Um, interestingly enough, uh, Wes, who actually promoted this, I think back in you know, 2017 or 2016, he actually then formed a company, um, Ursa Labs, which was the precursor to Voltron Data to do exactly this. So in some sense, you can think of Apache Arrow as Pandas 2.0. It's at a much lower level. It's, it brings um, uh, the uh, code much closer to the metal. Uh, it manages memory and so on and so forth. And it has a effectively a developer API. Maybe Pandas could just hook into that. Maybe that is a, a very doable thing. And I think as the years progress, maybe this is the right option. But I can't discount option two. Pandas has been doing this for a while. We've been doing very incremental improvements. Can we manage the compatibility? I think that's the, the crux of the issue here. We need to be sure that you know, we don't break the world. Uh, and I think we can uh, going forward. And I think also we can proceed to you know, make Pandas better, make it more performant than everything without maybe going uh, all out and switching to option one. So putting my Pandas hat on, I would probably choose option two. So. Let me summarize what we've talked about today. Uh, Pandas is one of the most important data science projects. It's been around for 10 plus years and it's been, it's, it's, we've reached a crossroads. The, you know, the collision between uh, big data and data science has been happening for the last couple of years. And Pandas is now, uh, you know, as people try to put more and more data through it, we have reached a point where we need to do something. Um, so which way do we choose? So, um, I encourage you to help us build a better future, whether it be some of my favorite open source projects, uh, Pandas or Dask or Ibis. Would love to have you to uh, you know, contribute. Uh, just go to GitHub and you can find these projects. And of course, Two Sigma wants you. Uh, we have full-time and internship opportunities. Um, Two Sigma is a great place to work. I mean, yes, I work here, but I still feel it's a great place to work. Uh, you know, we have openings for software engineers, quantitative uh, folks and business folks as well. And so uh, please come to uh, careers at twosigma.com and apply. Thanks everyone for this talk. Um, I really hope you've had a chance to learn about my role, about the Pandas library. 
uh, at a high level, how two Sigma likes to think about technology, collaboration, and how we engage with the open source community. So uh, at this point, we're gonna have some questions. So we'll have a little panel and you can feel free to ask me or some other panels about uh, anything you like. So go to slido.com slash TS presents and I'm gonna hand it back to Rachel. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I really appreciate that. Uh, it is now time for our Q&A. So please go to slido.com slash TS presents to ask any questions of Jeff or our recruiters will be on the call as well. And to answer our most asked, frequently asked question, yes, the session has been recorded and will be up on our YouTube. Um, so please submit all your questions using slido.com using the event name TS presents all one word. And we're now going to be joined by Jeff's teammate, Diego Torres Quintanilla, and a couple of our recruiters, Kyle Irwin and Tommy Grassi. So take it away, guys. Uh, thank you, Rachel. Uh, hello, everyone. So I do not see any questions on the Slido, but I have some questions that I would love to ask Jeff uh, uh, while we wait for some questions for, from the audience. Um, so Jeff, a question I had is, you know, you mentioned, um, that Pandas 2.0 is a possibility in the future for sort of, sort of breaking away from the current API, uh, and, you know, creating a new implementation that is based on newer technologies like Arrow. Um, but I actually wanted to ask about like Pandas today, I guess, Pandas 1.0, um, you mentioned there is already an optional dependency on Arrow. Do you think Pandas will sort of continue to trend in, in that direction where we depend, where Pandas depends more and more on Arrow and other lower level libraries? Thanks, Diego. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, I think up till now we've had, Pandas actually has very minimal dependencies that are actually required. Um, but I think it behooves Pandas to actually take a full-time dependency on uh, Arrow to make things just easier to do. Um, so I think we'll see more and more of this and even tighter integration, uh, you know, whether we choose path one or path two, um, I think we'll definitely see that going forward. Um, Jeff, a question for you from the audience. Um, what do you think would be the best way to start contributing to Pandas? Um, the uh, um, person asking the question mentioned They've merged a few PRs, but they're not quite sure where to go next. Uh, I see. So uh, first time contributors actually are super welcome at Pandas. We have tons and tons of people who, you know, Pandas is one of the first projects they contribute to. We have, I'll say, a, a fairly well-developed um, con contribution guide. Pandas is sort of easy to use. There's, uh, you know, from a contribution point of view, there are, you know, it's mostly Python. There are some uh, lower level, you know, libraries like, you know, Cython and C that you can contribute to as well. But we, we find it's a very easy experience for first time contributors. So of course, head over to GitHub, github.com slash pandas dash dev to contribute. Uh, and of course, the more you contribute, uh, you know, we'd love to uh, have folks become, you know, even maintainers of pandas. You know, you know, it's really a great way to give back to, you know, go from just contributing a few things to actually reviewing others code uh, and so on. Yeah, a an additional way I would personally recommend is attending sprints at any local conferences happening where you are, uh, especially high data conferences are a great way to, uh, you know, attend a Pandas sprint. I know Jeff has run several sprints uh, at PyData in New York City, and I'm personally aware of other Pandas sprints going on in, another, in, in other cities throughout the world. Um, so I'd like to remain on the topic of Pandas for a little bit, although I realize we also have a few questions regarding recruiting topics. Um, so, um, I like this question by Everto, um, how do you extract, Jeff, the part that is meaningful from the sea of complaints as an open source maintainer of such a large project like Pandas? Yeah, um, so this, uh, well, so Pandas gets a tremendous number of enhancement requests and a tremendous number of bug reports. And so, you know, one could argue that, well, there's lots of edge cases and the answer is there probably are, uh, but we do get, you know, that means people are really using it in ways which 
um, I'm not going to say it's not intended, but in ways which were not envisioned originally. Um, and this is a great thing, actually. You know, I, I went to a, a SciPy conference a couple of years ago, uh, and I, some some fellow came up to me. He's like, "Oh, I use this for geology," and somebody else says, "Oh, I use it for chemistry." I'm like, "Really? That's so interesting." And like, they have different uh, use cases. They really have different uh, features that they push on. And this is what makes uh, you know really solid open source library is having many many users really you know bang on it all the time. That's what makes a great library. So. I, to me, having more activity and, and more bug reports is, is a good thing. We'll fix them. Eventually, we'll fix them. And in the topic of, I guess, like other libraries that are popular in the space and probably also get a lot of issues, um, this is a question from, from Brendan. Um, you know, he says that the old adage of, uh, the old adage is that 80% of data science uh, it's mostly about data prep. What tools do you think are useful for data pre-processing in, in the Python ecosystem uh, outside of Pandas? Right, so Python generally is known as the batteries include language. It's like, you know, one-stop shop to have everything. Of, of course, uh, in data science, now we have many libraries that you need to use, uh, you know, Pandas among them, uh, you know, NumPy and SciPy and Matplotlib and so forth and so on. Um, Absolutely, there's tons of libraries like, uh, you know, to do things like uh, validate your data pipelines, like, uh, you know, Pydantic or Pyjanitor, things like that. Um, there's tons of libraries to, you know, orchestrate these pipelines. Um, I mean, the Python ecosystem has pretty much everything. And that's some of the, the, a lot of the cool things about it, um, I, I, I think. So do you have any libraries that are your go-tos in, in the Python ecosystem outside of Pandas? So, so that's a, like a leading question. I think for years I've been trying to build everything into pandas. Uh, well, not really that. It's more like you can stay within pandas, um, you know, and do all kinds of data prep that you need. I mean, of course, there's. I'll just mention some of the higher levels, you know, TensorFlow and Torch and and Scikit-Learn, of course, for machine learning type of things. Um, I myself don't do too much of this. Uh, you, know, they, you know, pandas really does, you know, satisfy a, a lot of needs, and that's why you know it's my go-to tool. And I guess, you know, sort of taking off your pandas hat and putting on your, your two sigma hat, obviously at two sigma, you have internal libraries like bamboo. Um, one question from the audience from David is what, what is bamboo doing for two sigma that Ibis isn't? And also with your pandas hat on, does it make sense to do something of what Ibis is doing within pandas? Yeah, these are two very interesting questions. So uh, the first, uh, what does Bamboo do that IBIS does not? So uh, to answer that question, we basically, uh, Bamboo provides, we'll call it connectors to our internal data sources uh, at Two Sigma. You know, whether we're getting data from, you know, X or Y or Z, we basically uh, turn these table-like data sources into things that IBIS knows about. So we are using uh, Bamboo, as, you could think of it as the glue between our internal systems and IBIS itself. So we actually construct expressions using regular old IBIS expressions. Um, and it's, we really try to use the open source as much as possible um, and, and not build our own thing. We build uh, you know, connectors, um, a little things on top, but we really try to use IBIS as much as possible um, you know, internally. Um, as far as the second one, actually it's a very interesting question. You know, if we could say, well, this is the API that we want to use. Could you know, uh, you know, pandas actually use that? So, th so th this is one part of the question. So, say part A, where could pandas expose Ibis as an actual API, and then you know, like essentially expose an addition, uh, uh, um, a alternate API that is eagerly executed. The answer is we could. I think that would be confusing, but we could. Um, the inverse question is. Could pandas use IBIS internally? Um, we could translate. So this is a fundamental, one of the fundamental problems in pandas right now. I shouldn't say problem. I view this as a feature. It's eager execution, meaning I write something down, hit return, and it just immediately does the computation. The problem with this is it does not afford me opportunity to, uh, you know, optimize an expression. For example, 
say I'm doing a filter and then I'm doing a sum. I don't have the opportunity to first do the filter or do the sum while I'm doing the filter. I can't rearrange operations. In IBIS, you can. And in most of the distributed data frames uh, libraries, you can do this. But in Pandas, you cannot. And without a fundamental change to Pandas, which I think would be a very big break, meaning would we support some sort of lazy evaluation? Um, yeah, so, so that's the answer to that is it's not easy to do. And that's why I think otherwise we probably would have gone down that road a long time ago. I don't know if that answers the question, but if not, please ask another one. If you think eager evaluation is sort of there to stay in, in Pandas, uh, and this is a question from Eberto, um, what are some parts of Pandas that you would like to deprecate, but it, 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 is, it is not possible to do? What are other parts of Pandas that you would like to deprecate, but are not possible due to backwards incompatibility concerns? Sure. Uh, so uh, one of the big warts um, I feel in Pandas is, is the in-place keyword. Uh, I think we tried to get rid of this a few years ago. It was too big of a break. Now, just to give an example, this is where you can take a Pandas data frame and then do an operation in place, meaning you're not getting a new object back. All operations in Pandas currently give you a new object back with the very small exception of some indexing operators. And so the reason I want to do this give a new object back is the fluent like syntax. It's a very natural way to write pandas. So some folks have the misplaced perception that in place actually does help, that it actually does things in place. In a very small subset of operations that is true, but most of it is not. And so this is, it's a very confusing keyword. It doesn't actually help. And it offer, it, it really kills the fluent like syntax. So that is probably my, the biggest word I've ever seen, and and you know one we're really trying to actively get rid of. Unfortunately, this is also done in a not. Uh, this will not be backwards uh, compatible. We'll have to do this in say pandas 2.0 in, in the next ver the next big uh, uh, version of pandas. Definitely agree. I've definitely so, been there where I am confused as to what in place exactly does and what things are in place, which ones are not in place. Uh, but Jeff, I want to give you a quick break from the marriage of questions so that we can. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, recruiting. So two questions for Kyle and Tommy. Uh, the first one, uh, what is the difference between the roles of quantitative researcher and data scientist at Two Sigma? Uh, I guess I'm happy to take this. So first off, my name is Kyle. I'm part of the uh, experience hire recruiting team at Two Sigma, primarily within the engineering side, but I'll, I'll take a stab at uh, a quantitative research question. So um, Effectively, you'll see there's a lot of crossover between data science, the data science uh, and uh, scientists, sorry, and quantitative research role. Um, very similar backgrounds, uh, you know, academic experience, professional experience. However, um, I guess I'll see that I think of it as more of like on like a line, right? And and um, you know, data scientists there are some on one side of the the spectrum we'll call it that are a little bit more product focused. So they're focused on um, you know data analysis and trying to gain insights through data that help maybe us determine um, you know uh, user behavior um, like product enhancements, do A-B testing and things to that effect uh, that might help inform and direct our business from, again, more of a product sense. Um, on the other side of that spectrum, in like traditional quantitative research roles, focus on applied research, um, utilizing different methods, math, stats, machine learning, deep learning, um, you know, to uh, 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 build and deploy uh, models into our trading production. Um, so more on the application end of our uh, the hedge fund portion of our business. Um, and there's some crossover there in between, right? So it's it's definitely not um, as black and white there, um, you know, one side or the other, definitely some crossover, but um, I guess at least uh, from my understanding <laughs> um, and, and, you know, talking a, a little bit more broadly, um, those are some of the, the you know, differences you may see. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, and Another question regarding recruiting is, uh, can people outside of the US apply for Two Sigma internships? I'll take that. Um, my name is Tommy. I work in engineering campus recruiting. So um, internships and people that are about to graduate. Um, so in terms of our internships, um, generally we require our interns to be enrolled in a US university. Um, we do also have some intern opportunities in the UK. Um, and those uh, are for students that are UK citizens or are on a student visa. Thank 
Thank you, Tommy. Um, that was a quick one. So I'd like, I'd like to make space for a, a couple more uh, uh, recruiting questions. So one question from Saurabh is, when is Two Sigma starting to hire for new grad roles? And how can I stand out in the application process? Yeah, it's a good question. So um, our roles will be posted. Um, I think we have a couple already up on our careers website. So if you um, search our careers website for either internship or the word campus, um, you'll find some of the opportunities that we have. Um, there are more roles that are going to be launched within the next couple of weeks. So um, we encourage you to keep an eye out for any postings that we have. Um, in terms of standing out, um, there's a couple of things that you know that we you know we look for. Um, but in particular, people that are um, show enthusiasm that seem to be really excited about the work that they're doing. So, um, you know, maybe um, you're part of a student group, um, maybe you participate in hackathons, things like that. Um, something to show that, you know, you're really excited and you're eager to continue learning and developing. We have a very education focused um, culture at Two Sigma. We want people that are excited to learn and grow. Um, so that's something that, you know, I think that stands out on a resume when we're looking at them. Thank you, Tommy. Um, actually, I think I said a couple, but I think that was the last uh, question regarding careers. Um, all right. So I think we have a few minutes left on the call. So I would definitely love to ask a few more of these questions for uh, Jeff regarding uh, the pandas world. So the top question right now, which I think it's a very interesting one, Jeff, is uh, from Mike. What's the next big addition you'd love to see in Pandas given unlimited funds and resources? Hmm. Interesting question. Um, unlimited funds, huh? Well, I mean, I think we really would, uh, you know, behoove us to take a stab at doing uh, where we can take a piece of Pandas and make it able to work on multi-core. So I wouldn't go all out. Um, for example, uh, today we accept uh, an engine keyword in group by, for example. So this we allow um, uh, to defer a group by expression to number. Well, I would like to see that even expanded even more to be able to you know, do multi-core when it's available you know, by default. And this is not a trivial effort. Uh, you know, once, once you, you know, have multi-core algorithms, you really need to, you know, engineer them properly and be able to release the gill and so on and so forth. And so this would take some quite some effort, but I think, uh, you know, this is one of the big bottlenecks there. Uh, similar cases could be made when we merge, you know, large pieces of data. So I would say, um, given enough funding, we could uh, extend the the top level of this 10 gigabytes to make it, you know, 20 or 30 or 50 gigabytes, you know, very easily, you know, workable to extend the workload that can be done in Pandas uh, in, in a similar way. I think that would yeah, definitely would be helpful. Thank you, Jeff. Um, one more that just rose to the top, uh, which I think is also of great interest to us at Two Sigma. What is your take on using pandas in notebooks in production in, uh, in production environments versus you know loose uh, scripts or libraries, and which one is, is your priority? Uh, in pandas. Sure. Um, well, I think using pandas in notebooks is awesome. You can, you know, do the ad hoc and experimental analysis really, really easily. Um, so I think pandas in notebooks is awesome. The question is whether you want to do that in production. I think that's a different question for, you know, uh, particular organizations. Um, I really don't prefer, you know, using notebook code in production at all. Uh, you know, we should make proper libraries and use them, you know, use them import in the notebook. You know, so I think there's really a trade-off here of, you know, having proper engineering around, uh, we'll call it library-like code that is, you know, well-tested and, and, and formatted and so on. Um, certainly using pandas because that, you know, makes it very easy to do lots of things. Uh, and then use those libraries in your notebooks. I think is a very, uh, a, a nice, nice feature to have. Building on top of pandas is actually super useful for, for lots of, you know, lots of folks. Um, but as I said, I would, you know, probably shy away from using notebooks in production themselves. But for research and development, excellent choice. What about pandas use in production specifically? Sure. Um, 
as I say, we do use pandas, you know, quite a bit at Two Sigma. We do use it in production. Uh, you know, pandas is a, as I say, a very well-tested and mature library. Um, if you're going to, you know, I'll, I'll tell you from my experience, you know, one of the big challenges is really bringing codes from, you know, a research type environment to production. And it really does help to use sort of the same code. Um, you know, this is one of the reasons we built Bamboo is to do exactly this. And I think that, um, you know, using well-tested libraries, you know, for research is great, but if you can't translate it to production, not so great. So um, I'm a big pro proponent of uh, doing, you know, using pandas in production. Awesome. All right. Uh, I think we're basically out of time. I wanted to give a couple of minutes for any closing notes uh, that anyone might have in our panel. Uh, I'm happy to empower you for one last question. Okay, uh, that sounds good to me. Um, so one question that we have uh, from our friend Terry, um, how has the growth of the pandas user and dev community over the past 10 years compared to that of the scientific open source software ecosystem more generally? Has, has Pandas encountered any unique challenges in that regard? Interesting question. Um, so uh, if I understand what's being asked here, has Pandas uh, growth either outstripped or taken away or enhanced the rest of the ecosystem? I would actually say, um, I think, Pandas growth has really helped the ecosystem sort of generally. You know, people come to Pandas, hopefully they had, had a good contribution experience. Uh, and then they can go on, you know, sometimes it's a, it's a stepping stone. You know, you, either you, you know, stay with Pandas and contribute, or maybe you want to contribute to other libraries. Uh, you know, uh, and so I think the combination, it's not just Pandas really. I mean, we, yes, we'll take some credit for things. But, you know, NumPy, for example, in the last few years has become a really big powerhouse in contribution. They have lots and lots of newcomers, even though, you know, personally, the code base is, is harder to contribute to. It's mostly written in C and performance, you know, really is, is crucial there. So um, I think Pandas provides a great stepping stone here. And, you know, as a companion, people can contribute all across the ecosystem in, in, in a very easy way, I think. Okay, so that is all the time we have. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, to learn more about Two Sigma, check out our blog at twosigma.com slash insights. You can also check out openings at twosigma.com slash careers. If you have any questions regarding applications, you can contact recruiting at twosigma.com. And please keep an eye out. This will go up on YouTube soon and you can share it out to everyone who had to miss it today. Uh, thank you all for your time and thank you, Jeff, for being so generous with yours. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Have a good day.